Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pettigrew, but this is actually a very special episode of MBR where we are simulcasting this, and it's also going to be on my new channel, the Utah Interfaith Forum channel. And I want to remind everybody that I want you to go over, and I'm going to do screen share real quick. So I want to share with the audience here is, now you're all familiar with my channel, Mormon Book Reviews, but did you know I have another channel? Well, of course, we got the Steve Pinecker channel, which... I occasionally post some goofy stuff there, but I've got this other channel called the Utah Interfaith Forum. It's a new channel that we're just getting off the ground. And of course, our good friend David Boyce uh, did an exclusive interview with us from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks to kind of give a soft launch of the channel in December. But now we are full blown going to start doing this and we're going to be putting out some great conversations that broaden out the conversation from just the evangelical talking to uh, the Restoration and Utah-based people, but also broadening out the conversation where other faiths are also having conversations with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the overall Restoration. By the way, we I'm talking to people that are currently working on a Hebrew translation of the Book of Mormon. It's outside of the purview of the main church, but we I even help, help them line up some Hebrew scholars to work on that translation. And of course, we all know about my good friend, Dr. Nehemia Gordon, uh, who is a uh, one of the top Hebrew scholars in the world. And of course, we're going to be doing our, hopefully starting soon, our read through the Book of Mormon together, along with some of the top Mormon theology, the, the, uh, bib, uh, Book of Mormon um, theologians and scholars on the program as well. And before I introduce my guests, I want to thank uh, my, my co-host, Monica. Welcome back. I love the, all these wonderful guests you're booking for us. Uh, Monica, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. And uh, of course, you just recently uh, took my homie, Dr. Kyle Bashirs, on a whirlwind tour of the Temple Square, I hear. And, yes, uh, whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just so I know, uh, did you did you just take him or were the students along for the for the uh, for the tour as well? Because I know um, there were, I believe, 17 okay. students and then some leaders that went with the group okay. for the trip and then pastor. Okay. Yeah. And Dr. Kyle Bashirs is a pastor of a uh, mega church, consistent pastor in Mobile, Alabama. And every year he brings a group of evangelical college students to Utah to do interfaith dialogue with the restoration. So again, these are behind the scenes things happening. We help line these things up. And another person who's really been a very important voice in this conversation, uh, a Jewish voice. And that's why I talked about a lot of the Jewish stuff at the beginning, is we have a very special guest, Rabbi Joe Charnis, <laughs> Charn, Charnis, it. right? It. <laughs> okay, and we got it right, Rabbi. Uh, we were, we were. I've struggled with some names sometimes, and you're, you're a very patient man, uh, Rabbi. Welcome to the program today. Thank you, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So we had a good forty-five minute conversation before we started taping. We're like, we got to start taping, and uh, but it was. Really I'm good. surprised you still want to tape after listening to me for forty-five minutes. <laughs> I was like, I thought that was the Monica, end. Monica, how did you get me into this? Right, you know what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> but after struggling with the lighting and your daughter coming in and helping, it was really good to have this great conversation with you that preceded us taping. And Rabbi, I just, I just want you to tell, just tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, your your faith background. Uh, I know you don't want to talk be too partisan, but just kind of as a general uh, idea of your faith background, and then what kind of got you into the interfaith space with uh, your conversations with Latter Day Saints, uh, the Latter Saint Day Saint tradition. Sure, sure, that's a great question. My background is Jewish, and I, in my later years, early well later years, now I'm in my later years. In my 20s, I began to focus more on the inner dimension of the Jewish faith, not simply the observant form-based practice of, of a Jewish life, but the what actually can animate us as a result of living that practice or, or those through the study of our sacred texts, how can that inspire me in life to live? a better life and to deepen my connection with what is truly enduring. So that began in the 20s, in my 20s. And over the years, what I don't even know the the turning point, but I became interested in other faith communities also because I saw people of great wisdom 
and great beauty and great love who were coming from another faith tradition and sometimes a non-faith tradition, uh, just completely humanistic or secular in their outlook. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand more about the wisdom that helped them become the beautiful human beings that they were. And I started studying other faith communities' wisdom because of that. And, and, and there's one, one, one aspect also that I think is important to understand about Judaism. In Judaism, we don't have the need for the world to become Jewish, to have a, a relationship with God or to be in right relationship with God or in Christian language to be saved. You don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to be a person of faith to be in right relationship or to be redeemed ultimately. Judaism foundationally is focused on how we live as a result of our faith and our vision, whether that includes the divine being or whether it is re that, that aspect of, of, of existence is removed and they lean more towards a secular system of, of faith or of, of philosophy. How we live is what ultimately determines our, our ultimate end after this plane. So I, I, was, I was never looking at the other faith community as a way of seeking to understand them so I could counter their faith and let them see why you have to follow it the right way. My goal always was understanding the other period, because we have a very interesting teaching in our, our Jewish tradition. In, in, in our, what, what, what we call the, it's the Mishnah, it's a part of our tradition that is oral. We have the Bible, we share the same Bible, or Old Testament at least. But in addition to the written text, we also have an oral component to our faith that was eventually written. And one part of that oral component is called Mishnah. And in the Mishnah, there's a beautiful teaching. It's a legal text. It's a legal text. But there's great, great wisdom beyond the legal form. And one teaching there in a section called Pirkei Avot, or Pirkei Avais, depending on which kind of Hebrew you speak, uh, it says there that who is wise? It asks the question, which I think is all of our questions. I see Judaism as a very broad way, not just only, it's the way for Jews, for example, this, but the wisdom also has a much broader basis that we can all learn from, and I believe that about other faiths too. So the question that it asks is, who is wise? It's the name of the person who's asking the question is Ben Zoma. And he says, who is wise? And the answer he gives, I think, is just beautiful and a model for what you seem to be doing also with this podcast. So the answer to the question, who is wise, is one who learns from every human being. Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting is the Hebrew word for, for learns is can also be understood legitimately, grammatically, as one who is learning in an ongoing, constant fashion. It is a practice, not just learns, yeah. but it is your way of life to be learning from every human being. And it notice it doesn't say he learns from a saintly rabbi or from a Jewish scholar. It uses the most generic and broad term for a human being, which means every human being. So with that as, as a sort of grounding, that's how I view life. I try to view life through the prism of that wisdom that every human being I, I encounter, wherever they are, in their sacred outlook, I can learn something from them because they are humans and we all have ultimately in my faith, whether they agree with this or not is, is irrelevant, but I believe we all have that one root, which is the divine source and origin of all that exists. So if we're all grounded in that, I can learn something from you because you have that same root You've just blossomed differently. And I want to see how God 
or the transcendent blossoms in your life so I can learn more about that holy transcendent being in my life. Wow, those are some very wise and powerful words, Rabbi. And I, and I just want and, and I just wanted to kind of uh because obviously, you know, not a lot of people, uh, you know, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is is in the world in the world scene is is quite a small religion, right? And a lot of people don't know anything about it. And you know, of course, a lot of people say, "Well, why Steve as an evangelical Christian are you in even like why why would you be interacting in this space?" And I'm like, "Well, have you read the history? Have you met the people? Have you actually read the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon? Have you, have you heard about this semi-literate farm boy who literally changes the face of American Christianity and Protestantism?" Um, this is a very important religion, and it's and it's an it's an amazing story of a people of a, yeah. a very important people group. And so I wanted to ask you, Rabbi. What what was it for you? What what was that moment where? And also, I wanted to ask you too. Just and this is a secondary question that you can get work okay. away or around to. But also, I also I'm curious about any interactions you may have had with my people, the evangelicals. But let's first mm. talk about uh, the 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 saints uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints and your interactions. What 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 led you into that space? When we were in the let's see where were we? We were in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We were stationed, my wife is a, a rabbi in the Air Force, or she's retired now. She's a chaplain slash rabbi. And and by the way, Rabbi, <laughs> you said that she was the first female rabbi in the Air Force. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Wow. Yes. Trailblazer. Trailblazer. And you know what that makes me? But you know what that makes me? The first female rabbi's husband in the Air Force. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want my autograph? Yeah, there you go. No, she is. And she just retired uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we're now back in Colorado, and we'll figure out where we're going to go from here. But in the, at the Air Force Academy, we, my, my wife met as a result of being a chaplain, some of the Latter-day Saint community. And that's how it all started. And we had, uh, I want to say this nicely. We didn't have a large Jewish community. And very often, and this is just a, how do I say it? Now it's it's a sad, a sad development in 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 my opinion within the Jewish community that Judaism has become for many a cultural practice rather than an awakening inspiring practice. And I understand why. Believe me, I understand some of the difficulties within the Jewish faith wisdoms, the, the Jewish faith texts that we have, that they're often difficult to understand or to find that, that powerful insight. So people often leave and go into Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity or just secularism, but they remain culturally in their heart also Jewish. And so we didn't have a lot of Jews who were at the Air Force Academy, the cadets or the adults uh, or the staff who were interested in, in searching through and engaging with the wisdom and the, the observance of Jewish practice. So I told Sarah, I said, look, let's, let's start going out into the rest of the world and see if anybody else wants to engage with us and we learn about them and they learn about us in the process. And the Latter-day Saint community was probably the most open and welcoming community of human beings that took us up on our offer because that is their way. Their way is, <clears throat> in spite of the persecution, in spite of the denigration or the condemnation, or the alienation that they often experience in society, they still reach out and try to bridge and build communities, even though we might have theological differences. So that's how we ultimately got connected to the Jewish, to the Latter-day Saint community. And, and I even spoke about it on a, on an, on a podcast at, on church news. They, they did an interview at, after general conference uh, last general conference, I think it was, uh, it was episode 157 on, on the church news podcast. And I explained there in more detail what drew us and what keeps drawing us together, because it is a beautiful community. As, as you know, this is 
your new world. Mm -hmm. And it's an enriching world, not just because of their decency of heart, but also because of their, their texts. They're not as crazy as we think they are, but to know that you have to read the text. Yes. Agreed. Thank you. That's very interesting. So you, so you're engaging the Latter-day Saint community that you find that they're the most welcoming uh, for your tradition in wanting to engage you and have conversation and dialogue with you. And so I want to, I want to know the story of how you first started engaging these Latter-day Saints mm -hmm. and what ultimately got you on the platforms like the church uh -huh. news, uh, got you on scripture central, um, all these different programs, uh, maybe talk about how, because imagine here you are just engaging people, folks on the local level. Next thing you know, you're going on all these major Latter-day Saint uh, platforms. Maybe just talk about that. Yeah. And let, let me say one more thing about engaging others. Please. Uh, others are open, but the way that the Latter-day Saint community is open, from, from how I see it, is is much broader. It They have a, a an entire, almost, community that simply seeks to engage with other faiths. Other communities, they do it individually, but every every uh, stake has in its, and Monica helped me out with the language here, but you, you have it in your communications department, people who go out and try to build bridges with other faith communities in the area. Correct. And that that is so beautiful. It's not just that you're open, you're actively seeking. And, and when I was in Georgia, and I love Georgia, I literally, went to over 50 churches. I called them first. Nobody called me back except two. And, mm -hmm. and I said, would you like to do interfaith dialogue? And they said, no, <laughs> they were nice. But so I thought, okay, well, maybe you have to meet me because you think, okay, I'm Jewish. I'm going to be there to debate you. I'm not. So I started going and I went to over 50 churches in the couple of years that we were there. And I realized after a certain point, it's just not going to happen except with a very small number. Okay. And... Now let me just let me just stop right there because I want to give some context here. So of course Georgia is right in the middle of the Bible Belt. A lot of my yes. people, the evangelical Christians, many of those were probably evangelical oriented churches. Also, Colorado Springs is a hotbed of evangelicalism as well. It's the headquarters for Focus on the Family, James Dobson's group. It also was uh, Ted Haggard, the megachurch pastor. Oh, right. Who... Was the uh, was the 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 president of the National Association of Evangelicals before he the now disgraced Ted Haggard, but uh, but hopefully, we, of course, we pray for him and his rehabilitation, yeah. of course, and we love him. Uh, but but so so you are really you 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 know you were in uh, located in very the hotbeds of evangelicalism, mm -hmm. in both Colorado Springs and Georgia. So maybe speak to that, and then we'll get back to your engagement with uh, okay. going on these different platforms. But I think it's really interesting we explore that topic a bit. Yeah. So I it's. I love the evangelicals because, to be honest, maybe in another segment, I will tell you how my faith has been enhanced by the evangelical approach, by the charismatic approach. OK, it's 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 honest. And I get in trouble in my own communities when I talk about this, but they won't be listening to this probably. So I'll be OK. Uh, the evangelicals often the the, the individuals who are in the pews are very interested, but it's often the pastors who they may love me, which they do, and they'll do anything else with me as far as service to the community, but they don't want me up on the pulpit, as one pastor said, because you're not preaching Jesus. And I said, well, yeah, but let's talk about the Psalms or Proverbs. And he said, fine, but it has to ultimately come down to Jesus. And I said, well, now at least I understand. So the evangelical community is very rich, and there are some in Colorado Springs, uh, New Life. Uh, I, I've, I've taught there, and I actually go there quite regularly when we're in the area. Hmm. It's a very inspiring service, and they have some very, very thoughtful ministers there that I meet with every time we come out, my daughter and I, and we study together. They have they have great insights into life, and they're just beautiful souls to be with. So the evangelical community is also very rich, but I don't have that same, I guess, access to the community because many of the pastors, they have a, a different mission, a beautiful mission, but 
it's not necessarily overlapping with with some of my interfaith hope uh, and journey. And I accept that we have different journeys. Uh, so now you wanted to know the how yes. it so you, happened with now, the Latter Day Saint. Yeah, and then you go on all these major platforms. You're embraced not only by the people in the pews, but also uh, in many ways the leadership and 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 stuff in the church. So this was a different experience. First of all, thank you for honoring my people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, and just talking about now and other people, the peculiar people that are the members of, the, of or the Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints. And I say peculiar. Yeah, what? That's what they call themselves. That we mean that in the best sense of the term. Sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love it. I love it. What happened, actually, my studies of the, within the Latter-day Saint world of wisdom began with Come Follow Me. That's how it started. I decided when that came out, hey, maybe this is an opportunity to start going through with some of the Latter-day Saint leaders and the just local people in the pews or bishops or stake presidents or even a couple, a couple of general authorities, we and we we go through it almost every week together. That's how it started, and we would spend. I remember there was a temple president that I studied with regularly, every other week. We would go through maybe two or three verses at most in an hour to an hour and a half, and they were heavenly discussions. So that's how it started. Come follow me. It's a beautiful program, and it it has real potential to help you uncover deep, deep insight into life and how to live. And we can all go through it. But look, we have our weekly readings, just like the Catholics, if they, they follow the lectionary cycle. Come follow me is a type of, I guess, lectionary cycle. It's a set reading. We can read through it, and it makes no impact. What I always try to do and emphasize in my teachings is the importance not of getting through chapter number 15, or if you have five chapters this week, get a basic sense. You need, you need some sense of what the text is discussing. But ultimately, if there's nothing there that helps you root, and I mean root deeply, so that you can draw nourishing wisdom from those depths and living waters out of it. That will help you blossom into the world with more grace and more light. Then what, what are you doing? I don't care that you know, I know a person who knows the, at least the New Testament. I don't know his knowledge of the old or the Hebrew Bible, but he knows the entire New Testament by heart. And that's impressive on one level, but that doesn't touch my soul. What do those verses, how do those verses, I should say, transform your being, your person? I know that you memorized them, but how do the verses that you know transform your life, inspire your life, to seek to live a more beautiful life? That's ultimately what our readings must do. And the tragedy for most of us is we read through the text without allowing it to really till the soil of our souls so that we can have something that just ultimately the, the seeds of wisdom can blossom more beautifully. That's what I would say. And that's how I got connected with the Latter-day Saint wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I knew the New Testament already because I study that. I study it in, in Greek. I, I study, I do comparative theology. And the wisdom of the New Testament is profound. Again, that gets me in trouble sometimes in some of my communities. But the truth is the rabbi, and, and what's 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 funny about this is, or, or sad, one of our greatest rabbis in history, Moses Maimonides, we call him Rambam, Rambam uh, in, in an introduction to one of the, what, what I spoke about before, the Mishnah, he writes in a certain introduction to a certain portion of the Mishnah. He says that we are to accept or literally hear, but often it's translated as accept, accept the truth from wherever it comes, from whatever the source that it emanates, because truth ultimately is grounded in God. 
And so why wouldn't we want to learn beautiful truths from other faith communities? The divine manifests itself everywhere. And so why would I want to limit my vision to my own beautiful tradition? Okay, the, the, another great rab, Rebbe, they call him a Rebbe. It's the difference between a rabbi and a Rebbe. But a Rebbe is, uh, uh, well, they're usually in the Hasidic world, but they have the big black hats and the long curly cues, uh, you know, the peyote. <laughs> I shouldn't call them curly cues. Uh, they, he says, if you can't see God everywhere, you can't see God anywhere. And mm -hmm. I'm sure he wouldn't have applied it as broadly as I do, but to me, everywhere is everywhere. And whether the theology of another tradition's wisdom is exactly the same as mine, it's often very different, but it's just another avenue into the heart of the divine or another way up that, that proverbial sacred mountain. I went up this way and saw beautiful, beautiful scenery. And you went up the other side and had another beautiful encounter with nature. And then we meet in the middle and discuss, well, both of our visions are true. And they're both leading us to that greater place of wisdom and awareness and hopefully of light and love. So that's why I do. Again, it goes back to who is wise, one who is learning from every human being. Mm. Uh, I, I see that as a real practice in my life. And that's the that's the calling that I feel drawn to live by. OK, so speaking of calling, how about that? Monica, you know, of course, you have a calling, and and of course, this is your unofficially. The, the, this is not an, this is not part of your official calling with the church doing this, but uh, uh, but but you know, he 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 was even quoting your Mormon scripture in one sense about finding truth wherever it may come from, right? That's kind of a core uh, doctrine uh, in, in your faith tradition as well. I want you to speak to that, but also, Monica, I want you to maybe tell the audience a little bit what, because he talked about the Come Follow Me uh, program. I want you to maybe describe what that is for those of people who are not familiar with it, um, who are outsiders. Uh, just explain what the Come Follow Me uh, uh, um, curriculum and program is, because it's basically it's a four-year cycle thing where you go through and encounter each year a different uh, set of your scriptures. Just talk a little bit about that, Monica, maybe how you've integrated that into you. And then, of course, let's get you into the conversation and start talking with the rabbi as well. <laughs> right. That's okay. I love just hearing and learning, so it's good to sit back and just let them go. So um, with, with my calling, it is for outreach, and it's interfaith work. Um, when you do interfaith work, that's not to connect with them to convert. That's not the purpose of any of this. It is to build good relationships so that we can work together within the community to better the community, to better the people. Um, and then we all thrive if we're all working together. And uh, I love hearing his perspective because in my life, I've always heard that our religion, if there's any, it's going to be closest to the Jewish beliefs. Um, that's just something that I've always been told. So learning more kind of connects those. And I love his points of view of saying that we're all coming up the same mountain, maybe just looking at different scenery on our way up to the top. Um, I think that's beautiful <clears throat> because you can't discount their journey, their perspective, um, their visions of what they're seeing around them. And it does enhance us when we reach out and learn from so many people without judgment. Mm. I, I don't know that there should be another way. This should be the only way um, with understanding and eyes open to, to those connections and, and seeing the good in everything. I, I absolutely agree with that because God is in everything. He's in the beauty. He's in the surroundings. He's in the people. Um, and to transition into come follow me. It is a rotation of four years. You're going to go through the different scriptures. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to take a few verses each week and break those down and say, let's talk about this. Let's focus on this. Let's try and understand this better. And then when you come to church on Sunday, they're going to talk about that specific week's information that you should have processed. And, um, it should start in the home because it's home centered, church supported. It shouldn't be on the primary teachers, the Sunday school teachers, um, the ministry, you could say, um, which is our bishopric, 
to teach you all this doctrine. It should be starting in the home. It should be taught from the parents to the children so that you're starting this, you know, hopefully generations of teaching in the home, teaching them not only what the scriptures mean, but that's going to bring out other conversations, right? How to be a good person, how to maybe do things like this, be more interactive and, and less judgmental. And um, you can build on all of those lessons. But when you come to church, then you, you are prepared to engage in those discussions. Um, and when I have time, I listen to a few podcasts here and there and, and really here and there. It's very random when I have time to do that. Um, but I like to hear other people's perspectives of the Come Follow Me because there are podcasts that directly talk about Come Follow Me. Yeah. Um, and so within my own faith, I'm getting different points of view and just different perspectives, maybe a deeper dive than I would do. Mm. And um, that's a blessing. I mm. think we can find blessings, not just from our own faith, but from all around. And um, here's just an example that, that came to me. Um, I went out to lunch with a friend who is of another faith. And before we ate lunch, she's like, we need to bless our food in the restaurant, right? Here I am, active Latter-day Saint. We're supposed to bless our food, but that's not something I regularly do, mm-hmm. And right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I was so impressed by that example of her, like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to bless this food right here at this table. And um, we can grab those things and take them into our lives. Yeah. And as we do that, we just grow and grow and grow. And I think by the time we reach the top of that mountain, (laughs) um, if we do absorb the good things from others, we'll just be more prepared to, to love everyone that we meet at the top of that mountain. I love it. I love it. Rabbi, what do you say to that? Amen. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. What else is there to say? Oh, that's great. What else is there to say? It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful path that your, your community and you specifically, but it's a result of your communal uh, tradition, your community's tradition. It's very beautiful. And I, I, I struggle because I, I know we all have our, our individual approaches and our paths that we follow along life. And many times they're parallel. They don't have to all be the same. I love the beauty and the richness of the differences that we often have. And often they are simply parallel. They don't necessarily part ways. Sometimes they do, but I have to be very, you know, I was sad in Georgia and I wanted more connection. I wanted more community. I wanted more dialogue, but I also have to understand that if I'm truly a person of tolerance and of, of diverse, I have a, I understand the diversity of visions that are out there. I have to then respect that not everybody is interested in the faith of another. And that doesn't make them in any way less of a spiritual person. They, they but have I, their I totally rich focus. I understand what you're saying. Cause I have encountered that, you know, you yeah. go to visit someone at their worship services and worship with them. They're even reading out of the King James Bible, which I read out of. And what he's preaching is pretty on track. But at the end of that, he says, you know, we we don't connect with anyone and work with anyone that does not believe exactly as we believe. Mm-hmm. I said, even in service projects, <clears throat> I could connect you to um, nonprofits in the town next to you that has lots of nonprofits that are not affiliated with religious groups. Would you want information on that? And they wouldn't even go Mm -hmm. that route. So I, when you try and engage and then you get that, it's, it's hard to understand, right? It's like, it is so much good here. I know. Um, So I feel your pain and for you to have that magnified with tons of rejections or maybe those welcoming (laughs) statements, it's hard. Yeah, but but what happened over time, not immediate, yeah. <laughs> over time, I realized that if I'm honestly a person of of tolerance, not just in on my lips, but I actually 
value the diversity of our, in our approaches. I have to accept that they have a beautiful path, although it's not my path, and they are doing good. They are doing valuable work on a different, well, in, in a different way. way. Yeah. And, and I have to accept that. Right. And, and it's very hard. It is, right. but but I've I've grown in that. I'm not I'm not perfect, right. but I've grown in it. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm actually I'm so glad that you two are even having this conversation, kind of because I hope that evangelicals out there that are listening to this, I think it's really important that outsiders how they're being perceived. And again, mm -hmm. you we honor we honor these different faith traditions and where they're at. But I also think it's really important that you know as Christians we are commanded to be salt and light to the world. And and I feel like sometimes because of our isolation and trying to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world, we lose our salt and light and our prophetic voice as a people. And so so I really feel like it's important that we have these types of dialogues so that people from different faiths and the people from my community can also recognize the importance of the interfaith dialogue and not be afraid if a rabbi comes, shows up to your church, give them a hug and uh, and uh, welcome them, embrace them. And realize that we do are we are part of the Abrahamic tradition, and uh, and and that's one thing that we do share that's really really important. And uh, and thank you for those the, the, that conversation. I think it was really important that it be ha had here. You know, Monica, and, I, and I, I, yeah. I want to add to yeah. that though. Still, lovely people. Yes. Right. So yep. that's where you have to land on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Still, but. lovely people. Wonderful people. Beautiful sermon. Right. And so that's right. what you have to leave with. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important. Now, I, I do want to say that there are uh, there is a contingent of evangelicals who are attacking me and uh, for for this project, for Mormon book reviews, for the interfaith conversations who uh, in, in one sense, you have to understand for them, there's so much more at stake because basically yes. they believe that if you don't believe the way I believe, you're going to go to hell. And that's it's an unfortunate. Uh, it's unfortunate, I have to say, to think that way because I think uh, that's kind of like knowing the mind of God. Like you already know who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, and our group is the, that group that's definitely going to heaven. And it's like, you know, I I think we need a little more humility there in our approach. With and so that's kind of where that that space that's where they're coming from. And I'm and and, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, they believe that I'm leading people astray. And I'm like, I'm saying, you know what? Your God is a lot more powerful than my, that I mean, the God I worship is much more powerful that I, that I can't find a, figure out a way that I could lead his people astray if that's how you look <laughs> at it, right? And yeah. then that, but, so I think it's kind of ridiculous to even look at it that way. And actually, I don't think that they, I think that's, that's the place that they're at. So let's just acknowledge that. And hopefully I can continue the dialogue with these people. Perhaps one day we could all come to the table and we can have civil conversations. That's my hope and prayer. Just so you know, Monica, currently as we speak, one of my friends, that we, a mutual friend, is reaching out to one of my critics today. Hopefully, pray, prayerfully, maybe something good will come from that. So now, Monica, one of the things, you had an hour and a half conversation with Rabbi yesterday, and <laughs> yeah. you actually had a lot of interesting questions that you as an outsider uh, asked him. And I just want to kind of maybe maybe bring to the table some of the some of the things that you learned from the rabbi about his faith tradition. And then, then maybe we could share that with the audience as well, because I think it's really important. Like, why do Jews like why, why do you wear what, what what is this? What do you what's on, on, on the top of your head? What, what do you call that even? You know, a lot of people don't even oh, know. Just maybe talk us. I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, I said. Um, I would love to look at this as if we know nothing about the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. Why do you wear the cap? What is it called? What are your religious clothing that you wear? And why do you wear it? Why do you respect it? Because mm -hmm. there's people around the world that do wear religious clothing, including Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think it's great to understand that there's so many people out there that have this peace in in their religion and how can we learn to respect that instead of mock it because wow. i don't think that we need to mock anybody based on their belief if it's if it's not affecting you then then wait why can't we just leave it sacred to the people who believe it is sacred and you know monica thank you for asking that question and i actually want to share a quick story um that i haven't told publicly before so I am plugged into this world, and I'm also plugged into not only to the Latter-day Saint world, but I'm plugged into the Christian evangelical world. And on one of my trips to Utah, 
I found myself in a room with a a ministry that does uh, a ministry to Mormons, I guess. And, it's, and it's, this is a very delicate conversation, so I don't want to give too much information. But unbeknownst to me, I walk into this room, and these are Christians, and they have laid out all the sacred garments of the temple sitting there. And I'm sitting there like, oh, I was blindsided. Now, I looked at it and I thought, okay, I'm going to treat these garments with respect because I know how sensitive this is. And of course, I'm a very curious person. So I carefully handled them. And I said, okay, I'm going to be solemn while I'm handling these things because I didn't look, I understand this is very sensitive, right? But I felt like I felt like these are sacred garments. I'm not going to put them on and make jokes and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so that was the way I was approaching these sacred garments of your people, Monica. And I, I just wanted to share that story because I, I feel like that it's really important that we do honor people. And, and, and again, these evangelical Christians that dress up in temple clothing outside of general conference or when there's um, an opening of a new temple and mock your people, this is, this is the dark side of my community too. So I just want to mm -hmm. let you know, I didn't intend to go in that room. I didn't know what was in there, but I felt even at that moment, I, I needed to be solemn. So I wanted to share that story. And then, Rabbi, I'd like for you to talk about, you know, what the, the the sacred objects that you wear. Yeah, I actually want to follow up with what you just said about the Latter-day Saint sacred garments. The last general conference that I attended in, what month are we in now? It would have been in April. We know who stands outside of general conference you have groups out there that are not particularly friendly they they claim to be christians i don't know if they're hired guns or if they're actual christians i generally don't speak to them uh, the last couple of times i've been there they've mocked me uh, so i felt this time i i felt comfortable engaging with with a couple of them who spoke somewhat condescendingly to me and about my faith in addition to about the Latter-day Saint faith. And one of the people there, speaking of the sacred garments, which most traditions have some form of, there was a, I'll use a nice term, he was just a foul human being. He was a jerk in so many ways. He had a stick and hanging from the stick were your sacred garments, Monica. And he said, big sign on it, these garments will send you to hell. And I thought, wow, that's just really following the light and the love of what the New Testament is preaching, mocking another human being's faith. And the truth is, on some level, we all do this. Yeah, they are an, uh, just a, a, they are a model of how not to live, those folks out in front of Temple Square. But the truth is, I had someone once say to me over the garments it's like well why, why do you wear those things but it was clear that it was a it was it was a critical why not just a, a, a seeking to understand why right and then i found out they wore certain in their faith tradition they had certain garments and i said well i said i could ask the same question why are yours any more special than mine they're just different they're both there to help us in our spiritual walk and we all have different sacred garments. We all have, you know, people mock the food regulations in Judaism. You don't mix milk and meat or you don't do this or that. And it's like, well, yeah, well, every faith, look, you have issues with tea. So there's nothing wrong with it. We just have yeah. different food uh, sensitivities in our spiritual tradition, but right. they all have deep <laughs> wisdom, but we seem to be more open to our own strangeness than than mm -hmm. granting that same beauty to the other so yeah. as far as a garment here this is not biblical no matter what they tell you if anybody tells you some people like to find everything in the bible it's not in the bible it's a much later development about two thousand years ago and it's called in short we call it a kippah it comes from the root word of head you know because it's a head covering the a more traditional name for it, a more ancient name is Yarmulka. 
Yeah. And it's that's more Aramaic. Kippa is Hebrew. Yarmulka is Aramaic. And the rabbis teach that it, it's a it's a combination of two words. And it means to revere slash fear, but but with that reverential awe, the king who is above you mm -hmm. always. So for me, it is not simply a garment or the undergarments that we wear. They're not simply garments or ritual garments that we wear. They are also theologies that we are hopefully living with. And this is a reminder that I can be completely unaware of and forget. But there is always something above me and beyond me, beyond my understanding, mm. that I should be walking in reverence with and in awe with. Now, promise, I promise you, I walk through life not remembering <laughs> this constantly. But I have several points throughout the day where it goes crooked and I have to remind it, you know, re readjust it. And it's a reminder or I feel it on my head. And it's a reminder. We need reminders throughout the day. And our garments are a wonderful way of reminding ourselves like the fringes that we wear based on numbers 14. We have these long fringes that we wear uh, as an undergarment. That's to remind us to live a life of holiness. Because it says in, in Numbers 15, you will look upon them and you will remember the commandments. Okay? So all of these ritual items, ritual is often looked at, especially in, in, in some Christian circles, as unnecessary. But ritual or legalism, right? The legalism of the Judaizers, the scribes, the grammarians, Judaism and Christianity, or at least some forms of Protestant Christianity, see ritual or commandment very differently. We see the rituals in the Jewish world, the commandments, as a way of connecting with holiness, as a way of inspiring holiness within. The, the rabbis teach that the heart, or the hearts, literally in, in this book of education, it's called Sefer Achinuch. It's a, it's a book on education that, that an anonymous person, we don't know his name, but he wrote it about, what are we in now, 2020? About 750 years ago, he wrote it to his child and to his children's friends on how to awaken one's heart to holy awareness and to holy living. So it's a book on educating us to be more aware of the holy in life. And in there, in chapter six or section 16, he speaks of the hearts, he doesn't say heart of a person, but the hearts, the hearts are drawn after or follow action. It's not that we have to wait until our hearts are inspired. It's that our life, our action, our practice shapes our heart. And then we can follow our hearts. But if we just follow our hearts alone, that's not shaped by holy wisdom, holy action, holy mm -hmm. living, it might be something very different than our holy traditions would, would want from us. So this is a reminder for me to always be aware that there is something greater and wiser and more enduring that I am always living under and walking with and surrendering to. That's, That's a beautiful. way of understanding a ritual garment, but making it alive in your spiritual life. Now it touches my heart. It's not just something I put on my body. It's something that helps my body walk in life because it shapes my heart. So I live more beautifully. Mm, wow. I love that. I love it. Um, you That's know, true for all commandments. The strangest commandments that we have in the <laughs> Bible, we, we, we read them very poetically. It's not just empty formalism that they can become. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, Rabbi, I just, just because, uh, you know, you, you seem to take a very uh, charitable, charitable view of, people from other faith traditions, uh, and especially within the Restoration and as well as Christianity. And really at the core of our teachings is our teacher, uh, our Savior, um, our Lord. Uh, 
uh, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And I, I just want to know from your perspective, who who is Jesus to you? Okay, thank you. That's another, that's a brilliant question. And very often because of the history of Christianity towards, at least in terms of my community, Jews, it hasn't been great. It just hasn't been. That this is not a defamation in any way of Christianity. It's the Christians who have corrupted the beauty and the grace and the light of Christian wisdom. And this is no reflection on Jesus or Paul or any of the, the gospel writers. Human beings have just an unfortunate talent, like a PhD level talent of messing up our holy scriptures. Okay, sorry to say so folks. Uh, who I think Jesus is, and this one does uh, get me in trouble sometimes. One person, when we were at a place, when we did have a, a chapel where we, where we did our services, they said, if you keep speaking about Jesus, we're not gonna come anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is a particularly bad time to mention this to me because I have a church group of almost 40 people here. I kind of have to talk about Jesus. And so they ultimately stopped coming because I do have a very high view of, number one, the New Testament, and number two, Jesus and Paul and the gospel writers in general. I have a very high view, but not in the sense of like high Christology in, in Christian thought. Right. And I'm not a messianic Jew, folks. Just just hear this up front. I, I am not a messianic Jew, meaning I'm a, I, I follow a lot of Jewish traditions, but I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and he died for my sins and so forth. And I don't believe he's fully God and fully man like the creeds. I believe Jesus was a brilliant, brilliant. I'll call I'll say rabbi. He's called rabbi in the New Testament. And as, as we said before, if, if I'm learning, you know what the rabbis also teach in, in that same Mishnah that I spoke of, Pirkei Avot? If you learn one chapter from another human being, or even one word, or even one letter, you are to call that person rabbi. Wow. Wow. Oh, tell me about it. So the truth is, if I learn even something insignificant, they don't literally mean a letter. They mean something that's seemingly insignificant. You can learn from somebody even what seemingly is insignificant in terms of content, but they taught you something and they deserve that title, not official rabbi, but as a rabbi. And imagine if we walked through life looking at each other as our teachers, our guides, our instructors, our rabbis, our priests, our fathers, our, our ministers. Imagine if we looked at each other like that. I have something to learn from you, my teacher. We would treat each other differently and we would understand our faith traditions more honestly and honorably. But uh, where was I before I got off on the uh, learning from one? Well, letter. we're talking about Jesus. The, the, who uh, is Jesus. Jesus. So yes. Jesus is absolutely a great, great teacher. And back then they would have they did call him rabbi. Yep. He had brilliant insights. He had poetic vision and he had profound knowledge of the Jewish faith. However, there was somewhat of a parting, very often parallel. And very often his teachings are very, very, in my mind, when I hear his teachings, I've taught on the Sermon on the Mount many times and, and other texts also. They have a very Jewish echo in my mind, in my heart. Not because I wanna, I wanna, we, I just want to claim, ha, Jesus is taking Jewish wisdom. No, Jesus was a Jew, and he had deep knowledge of the Jewish faith, and I hear it in his teachings. What he often did was give brilliant parables that were grounded or rooted in a Jewish reference or a Jewish thought, and he developed them beautifully because of his own brilliance and creativity. Okay, so I have high, high esteem for Jesus as a teacher, just not as God. We have a difference in terms of theology over the nature of sin and then the way of salvation. And that might be another discussion for another time. It is another discussion for another time. But, but in no way do I see, 
I want this to be clear. There's an, there is, in, in some strands of Christian thought, there is an exclusive dimension that it is only through the person of Jesus that we are saved. Okay? We, we don't really have that in Judaism. The rabbis teach in general that all the righteous have a share in the world to come. It's, again, how you live, not how you believe. And in, in my mind, I do, I honor, I respect some of the different ways that we are quote unquote saved in the Christian faith, if you compare it with the Jewish faith. There are some differences, but it's not my theology, but I have deep, deep respect for the notion that somehow the God of all of existence would come down into a human being and die to save me because he loves me so much. And Jesus' life of giving up his life to save another who can, what, what else can you say except, wow, it may not by, be my theology because we have a different foundational understanding of sin. And if I start here with this theology of sin, it will lead me here. But if I start with this theology of sin, it will lead me logically to the person of Jesus. So we have different foundational theologies often that lead us to very deep teachings, but they don't often cross over very well so jesus is a rich thinker paul is a rich thinker who i struggle with but heck the new testament you know yeah, they, i, str they I struggle with yeah. i struggle with paul i'm in conversation with paul myself i think that's the important thing too is also we as believers can continue to have the conversation with the scripture producers as well and sometimes have a debate with them even though he said it two thousand years ago i can still debate paul and i think that's the beautiful thing about how we need to approach scripture in that context too it sounds to me like you're having the same conversation with with our scriptures yes and and i'm i'm deeply and i mean this if, if everybody else already fell asleep from from <laughs> listening to me uh you guys must have taken well not coffee well you can have coffee but uh not you monica uh <laughs> I have my lemon water. It's keeping me going. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, I, I, <laughs> all right. Well, I have some water. Um, I am honestly, I have been so broadened and so deepened by my exposure to other wisdom traditions, other sacred philosophies that I can't imagine not living in partnership and in dialogue with them. And, and it is painful that I'm often having the dialogue with myself. It is. Because if you're the other, you might lead us astray. That's how it's often understood. And I, I remember talking to the pastor, he was a beautiful soul, I said, who said, no, you're not preaching from my church, to, uh, my, my, my uh, what do you call that? Pulpit. Pulpit. pulpit, thank you. I knew it started with a P. With my pulpit, from my pulpit, unless it ends up coming back to Jesus. I said, yeah, but I'm talking about the Psalms. I said, there's more in addition. I'm not in any way denying. I said, I just would like to focus on the context of the Psalm. And he said, the Psalms are always pointing to Jesus. And if it's not ultimately about Jesus, you're not coming to my pulpit. So the truth is, I, I do accept that, and and I and on one level I think wow. He's almost in uh, he's seen Jesus everywhere, so how can I in any way be hurt by that? He is finding the light of his life, the light and source of his being, in something that I don't see. But he's a beautiful person because of that. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus is in Psalm, you pick your Psalm. Wonderful. And I don't have to go to your pulpit. I just hope to find other folks also who, who want to speak in addition, in addition, not in replacement, but in addition to yeah. their own wisdom. That's so, great. I love it. I love it. And I and I love how Christian Christianity is moving away from even the Catholic Church with post Vatican to you know moving away from yeah. deicide. Uh, embracing uh, the, the the Jewish people in a much friendlier way and charitable way than they have previously done. Of course, I come from the Protestant stream that broke off from Catholicism. And um, and so it's just really interesting that even there's a softening happening. And of course, the evangelicals probably are the greatest friends of the people of Israel yes. uh, in, in the world. 
And we have that. But I wanted before, because we, we always like to wrap this up with Monica's two questions. But before we okay. have Monica's two questions brought to the table here, I noticed that you, because because this is part of the Mormon Book Review's uh, orbit as well. I, I You had mentioned that you had a few books that you wanted to maybe share with the audience and speak about briefly. So maybe talk about those books that you uh, wanted to talk about and how that, and, and just discuss them. Me? Yeah. Rabbi, didn't you say you had a couple books that you wanted to share with the audience that talk about beforehand? You said you had a couple books on the table there that you wanted to. to... Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I have I have the Quad. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have the Greek New Testament. Okay. And I have the uh, a Hebrew Siddur, a prayer book, and mm. I have my what you would call the Old Testament, what we call the Tanakh, the the books of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, everything when in 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 the in the Protestant uh, or in the Christian Bible, we have a different order, uh, but it ends with Malachi. So yeah. everything from from Genesis to Malachi, I have those are the books I have. No, just in case we were doing any verses. Okay. I, so I wanted to ask I you, Rabbi, like, what is your favorite version of the New Testament? What 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 which one do you like re engaging with the most? Like, do you like ESV, uh, NIV, King James Version? What 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 text of the New Testament is one among your favorites? Okay, uh, the Greek. <laughs> oh, okay, I love it. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm sorry. But yeah. uh, the ESV is a very solid translation. The King James, uh, I don't want to say anything bad about translations. People ask me, which, which translation should we use for the Old Testament, for the Hebrew Bible? I say they're, 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 they're all equally bad and they're all basically as good. You know, it's a, it's a preference there. I think they're all horrible on okay. one level. Yeah. Because even starting with the first word in the beginning of Genesis, where it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning in English immediately loses several very profound potentials that the word in the beginning limits you to. Huh? So all translations necessarily limit the richness and potential that a verse is often offering us. So the translation ESV is a very good NIV is, is, is fine. It's, it's not always as exact. It can, they all convey the idea, but sometimes what will speak to me, uh, if they frame it in English it, with this translation, it'll speak more beautifully to me than another translation. It speaks more beautifully to you. So there's always that personal dimension, but I'm, I'm always interested more in what the potentials that a sacred text offers us, not in the choice of the translators who are all scholars. They're deep, deep scholars, very knowledgeable, but theology influences how you translate. There's just no way around it. And unless you study outside of your own reference, you won't see it. So if a Protestant and a Catholic both study uh, the, the Last Supper, they're going to read it very differently. Is it is is it just bread and wine or is there something more to it? Okay, theology influences translation. The reason that I try to limit, I, I, I look at English because sometimes it's just difficult. And how do you make it flow? But I never, I, I get a translation but I never limit myself to the translation because I see the broader potentials in the original languages that give you, that's where the song comes in. And that's where it's, ah, even if it's the most simple verse on the planet, that's so basic. You know what? There's something more there. That's how at least I read it as a Jew. I admit I'm reading into, but Jesus and the New Testament writers were mostly Jewish. So they had that background of the rabbis teach, in fact, they say there are uh, 70 faces. In English, they say there are 70 faces to a text, to the Torah. And by 70, they don't mean literally 70 and not 71. 70 is a, is a sort of sacred number in Judaism, which means universal, all-encompassing. So it's the, as far as a translation, ESV is very good. The KJV is is good when I understand it. I just don't understand some of those words. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so uh, NRSV. I want to know 
ESV is the English Standard Version. That's the short yes. that, and that has become probably the the preferred Bible for a lot of people in my camp to study. Uh, and it also has a lot of scholarly credibility as well. Do you, do you like the RSV or NRSV? Uh, I do like them too. I grew up reading from the King James and the NIV. So I come okay. from the Christian Reform. My family comes from the Christian Reform Church tradition, which that's the church okay. that origin that the basically the was birthed. Out, the NIV was birthed out of the Christian Reform Church. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's always been an important translation to me. But the case is a good translation. Yeah, yeah, and that that's the one that I grew up on with those two. And I always have a deep, and profound respect for the King James version sure. as well because it is truly a beautiful. Um, it's 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 it's. it's, it's <laughs> Yeah, the the level that it brings to the beauty, it does it sounds very scriptural right i mean there's yeah. a certain beauty in cadence and poetry in the king james version that i think should always be honored as probably one of the most important books ever written yeah. uh, or produced ever the king james version has been super influential on our culture and our society so yeah. rabbi i i i thank you so much for giving us uh, your insights into our scriptures mm -hmm. i think it's really important in your preferred translations and and i kind of want to i got to hand the microphone now to monica cuz she's got a She's got to ask the the two questions. So two questions. Away. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to make a statement first. Please do. Please I, do. I, I love what he said about you know the the differences in the Bibles and that some you're just like oh that's not correct and then this is correct. So I think it's important to say what we believe in as Latter Day Saints that the eighth article of faith says we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it has been translated correctly. So I think we all have to understand what he said, that it is translated by man. It is written by man. <laughs> and that there are going to be some things that we have to, you know, have a tussle with, with Paul about. <laughs> so it. anyway, okay. The last two questions are um, Father Joe. <laughs> brother Joe. <laughs> brother, brother. brother Joe, not father. Uh, I'm, I'm a um, father. Who, who can't do anything other than bless bread and wine. Nothing happens to it. That's the I'm father of, my, of our daughter, Yael. Yeah, so when you get to be good friends with Rabbi Charnas, then yeah, you call me Brother call Joe. Him. I'm happy Brother with Joe. that. Um, <clears throat> what is your favorite thing about your religion? How long do we have? <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. I, I reserve the right to edit my response in our next dialogue. Yes. yes. Or, full, or, or continue my response in the next dialogue. Uh, I'm going to do something or say something that... may not sound like the, or most people wouldn't offer as an answer in their faith or in the Jewish faith. But this deeply, deeply inspires me. And again, I could give you something about the, the way we can open and surrender, the process of encountering the divine. I'm going to keep it I'm going to go in a different direction. There's a beautiful teaching in our oral tradition. This time it's in the it's in the Talmud or in the Gemara, which is a it's another part of our oral tradition. And it says this, I wish this were a model that we all would live with. Not become Jewish, but this this model teaching I think would bring about a very, very different humanity. And it's very simple. It's not, it's not going to sound as great as just love one another, <laughs> which is brilliant. Okay. Uh, and well, I wish we had that. Is that one for all religions. Can we just put that? <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll, uh, yeah, th th this is mine. This is what I'm going to pick for today. Okay. In the context of our, our engagement in the Gemara, uh, again, the part of the oral tradition of Judaism. It says uh, in the section called Ta'anit, uh, about fasting, it says this gem. It says, teach your tongue to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that's not 
telling me about how I can, in Protestant thought, being slain by the spirit or anything. It's just, there is such a human dimension to this teaching, a human dimension, because so often in life we know everything. We know everything, and the problem is we really don't. Mm. And if I could teach my tongue to live with this wisdom of teach your tongue to say, I don't know, then mm -hmm. I have something to learn from you. Uh, whoever you are, and yeah. I will live differently and walk differently and relate differently to you because I have something to learn from you. So I don't know. I don't and here know. is my thought. I Amen. love it. I, I love, love it. it, my brother. You know, I refer to myself sometimes as an agnostic Christian, which means I'm an I don't know Christian. <laughs> Amen. How was that? Did you see my hand up? Yeah, I mean, preach it. <laughs> preach it, brother. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's a profound answer. And really, honestly, is it been at the center of my journey is I don't know, but let's find out. Monica, yeah. let's, ha let's ask question number two. And this is, I love this question because it helps us to look at others in a better mm -hmm. light. What is your favorite thing about another religion or faith belief? How long do I have to answer? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to give me a minute. <laughs> let me let me try. Okay, so start the 30 seconds in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh Oh, this is I'm going to talk about, well, let's see. You know what? I'm going to give two quotes. My favorite the favorite wisdom. It's not my favorite thing. It's my, I'm going to say the Two of the gems, I'm going to give two because I've got a Protestant and I've got a Latter-day Saint. And there's a lot of overlap between you. You got two books that you share and two books that you don't share. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a teaching, a favorite insight from from both traditions. I think we'll go. Let's go with first John. Chapter four. Verse seven. Uh, sorry, let's go to verse 20. First John chapter 4, verse 20. I think this is an absolutely heavenly verse. If this were the only verse that we had to live with as human beings and followers of a sacred path, this would be it. If we only had one, this would be a model. It says, those who say... I love God and hate the brother, his brother. So one who says he loves God but hates his brother or sister, we'll just use that, is a liar. You don't get it. It goes on. For those who do not love their, their brother or sister whom they, whom they have, who are able to see cannot love a God whom they cannot see. So... The idea of faith in God not manifesting itself or the claim to faith in God that doesn't manifest itself as love of fellow human being. The language there is so rich. You are a liar. Mm. You are just an outright liar. Right. Okay. It's not that we don't have that in the Hebrew Bible, right? It's based on Leviticus, you know, 1918 of love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. It is. And that teaching, though, from the New Testament is so rich and it's repeated. That that idea is repeated several times in John. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. If we love. If we say we love God, but hate our brother, a liar, my God. That is such such a powerful insight into the lie or the truth of most of our faiths is very often we are just, we're liars. We're masquerading. Mm. We've got to learn to live with that love, not only for God, mm. but for the And brothers. I love that you, you use that. I've been focusing on that scripture over the last couple mm. of weeks um, <clears throat> and just processing that, thinking on that. How can we all be better? How can we all become true followers mm -hmm. of the God that we love. Yeah. I love that. 
I love and it. I'll give you now from let's go from uh, let's go from the Book of Mormon. I think this is important. It's a beautiful. I'm going to give you two from the Book of Mormon. Sorry, you get two for free. Awesome. So from Alma five. Alma 5, verse 26. I'll tell you what I love about it also. It says, and now behold. First of all, behold. Yes. In Hebrew, hine. In he, that's a Hebraism. There you go. Uh, and now behold. I say unto you, my brethren. Listen to this. Listen to this. If ye have experienced a change of heart. If ye have experienced a change of heart. Stop right there and say. Have I even experienced a change of heart? Okay, fine. If ye have experienced a change of heart, and, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, does my transformed heart, my change of heart ever want to sing? And does it sing about redeeming love? Oh. I failed on all of them already. But if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, I would ask, ready? Can ye feel so now? How is that impacting you now? You had it back then, then why are you such a jerk now? That's Amen. what he's saying. No, sorry. <laughs> why isn't it here now? And how can I recover it? Can ye feel so now? I want that song of redeeming love. My God, my God. I don't know how anybody can't look at this text and say, yes, Lord, right? With the hands up, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Redeeming love. Are you singing about redeeming love? And I'll leave you with uh, Mosiah chapter two, verse 17. And just so you know, folks, just to give context here, um, Mosiah, uh, the second chapter of Mosiah would have been the one of the very first verses. I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional here. Uh, one of the uh, so there's this thing called Mosiah Priority that when Joseph Smith lost the, hon the lost 116 pages, oh, right. um, he continued translating Mosiah to the end of the Book of Mormon and then went back and started with the, what would later be put at the beginning. But as the Book oh. of Mormon was revealed, this was one of the earliest uh, scriptures ever revealed uh, in, in, in the current editions of the Book of Mormon. So I want I just want to give some uh, well, context there as well. Well, I, I think it fits beautifully in, in, in what we're all here seeking to do, which is learn from each other because we have so much to learn from each other. And hopefully it's not just we learned about it, but can we experience it now? Can I sing and live and walk and serve with redeeming love? That 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 language right there is unbelievable. It is just, it touches, If I'm so grateful I can experience it now. I just hope I continue to experience it. But I would round out our whole meditation today, which is what this was, with Mosiah, and thank you for that background. Thank you for the background on Mosiah. Chapter 2, verse 17. And behold, in other words, behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom. Wow. Folks, we got wisdom here. Let's take it seriously and learn it. Not just read it, but learn it. And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom. Why? that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. I think that fits beautifully with what I quoted from John, 1 John, and our whole approach here. Leviticus, I mean, love, love, Jesus is summing up, we have it in the rabbinic world too, love God and love your neighbor. That's it right there. And that's, that's the redeeming song that I hope we all sing and experience now. I hope we live with that. And I have so much more to learn. I have so much more to learn. And I hope that I am able to open more so I can experience now, like he says, I hope you experience it now. 
not just in the past. I hope it's an ongoing experience that I can live with and breathe with and serve with and walk with and grow with. That song of redeeming love in service of my God and of God's creation. So thanks wow. for having me. If you have any other questions, Thank you. I wanted to go to First Corinthians 13 also from Paul, which is amazing, but I'm I'm, I'm going to honor you. your time. Well, no, we'll tell everyone to go look that up. <laughs> exactly. So Monica, once again, thank you for helping uh, set this uh, wonderful, beautiful conversation up that we had today. This is what, the, these are the kind of conversations, folks. That's why for your, if you're a subscriber to more in book reviews, it's very important that you also become a subscriber to Utah Interfaith Forum, especially if this is something that's of interest to you. But these adult, important conversations are going to be held and we're going to have these, re I, I really feel like we all learned something today. And I think it, we increased in our wisdom as well. And uh, and also just, uh, it was I, I don't know, but Rabbi, I feel like you blessed me today. And it's a real honor and privilege to be blessed by a rabbi. Uh, folks, uh, leave your favorite Bible verses in there. Also answer the two questions, you know, what is your, what is the favorite thing about your faith tradition? And what is the, your favorite thing about other faith traditions? Put that in the comments. Let's start the conversation there. Those of you who are in the Utah Interfaith Facebook group, let's have that conversation there as well. So now this is uh, Mormon Book Reviews. So remember, uh, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews, but also this is UIF. And what have you done well, how is your faith walk and what are you doing to contribute to the interfaith process? This is the place where we see interfaithing in action. You all do well. God bless. There'll be links in the descriptions to many of the things that we talked about today. And I'm looking forward to continuing the dialogue with the rabbi. God bless. Mm -hmm.